tonight for another opportunity to engage both our hearts and our minds into the study of his holy and divine word. We're grateful for each of you tonight, and certainly it is our prayer uh, that the Lord will allow his word to rest in our hearts and in our minds, uh, that we may continue to do his holy and divine will. But Father, we thank you once again tonight for loaning us this time together. We pray, O oh God, by the agency of your Holy Spirit, uh, that you would have your way in each of us. For, O oh God, we are the clay and you are the potter. Make us and mold us, dear Master, according to thine own election, to the end, O oh God, that your name would be glorified and your people edified. Father, we thank you now. We ask your blessings upon this lesson. It's in Jesus' name we ask. It's in Jesus' name we do trust. And it is amen. Amen, amen. Tonight, our beloved, we want to continue in our series, God the Great I Am. God the Great I Am. Last week, we shared with you a lesson uh, entitled, Is God Pleased With Me? Is God Pleased With Me? And really, that's a personal inventory question. Uh, that we must ask ourselves. It's not a question that we ask opposed to our neighbors, but it is a question uh, that we ask of ourselves. Is God pleased with me? And the, and the foundational scripture uh, came out of 1 Samuel, uh, where Samuel goes to Saul. And Samuel says to him, uh, Does God delight as much as in burnt offerings and sacrifices? as he does obedience. God loves obedience. Uh, the sacrifices, the offerings, they have their respective places, but they do not trump, they do not uh, lord over the fact uh, that God wants obedience, and that's what he's after with us. And so we challenged you last week to look at that and to analyze that within your own respective lives. And so we want to continue in that thought process tonight, uh, actually part two of Is God Pleased With Me? And I want to invite you to look with me at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 5 through 8. And I want to read it first. Uh, from the King James Version, and then I'll later read it out of the Amplified. But 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, it says, And besides this, give it all diligence, and to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But watch what verse 9 says. But he that lacketh these things is blind. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye should never fell, fall. Excuse me, you should never fall. Second Peter, I want to read it out of the Amplified Version this time because the Amplified gives you a different uh insight on of those very same words. It says, for, in, for this very reason, applying your diligence to the divine promises, make every effort and exercising your faith to develop moral excellence and in moral excellence, knowledge, insight, understanding, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, steadfastness, and in your steadfastness, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly affection, and in your brotherly affection, develop Christian love, that is, learn to unselfishly 
seek the best for others and to do these things for their benefit. For as these qualities are yours and are increasing in you as you grow towards spiritual maturity, they will keep you from being useless and unproductive in regard to the true knowledge and greater understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is blind, short-sighted, closing his spiritual eyes to the truth, having become oblivious to the fact that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, believers, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Be sure that your behavior reflects and confirms your relationship with God. But by doing these things, actively developing these virtues, you will never stumble uh, in your spiritual growth and will live a life that leads others away from sin. Hmm. Is God pleased with me? God continues in utilizing the circumstances of life to shape our character and develop the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Whatever growth we experience is the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit. Part of his grace is God places tangible tools in our hands. Well, what are these tools that God places in our hands? God places tools in our hands like prayer. He has given us the avenue of prayer to constantly remain in contact with him. He has given us his word. He's also given us the church. Yes, God has even allowed some adverse circumstances to come into our lives to spurn spiritual growth. Every person's pilgrimage is different, but the grace of God is the same. Spiraling upward, growing in Christ, is a process that requires that we give it all we got. So tonight, beloved, if we are serious concerning our walk with Christ, then we need to look with new eyes at what God expects and demands from his followers. Growing is important. Just like in the natural world, our parents expected us to grow we also have the same expectation of our children and our family members. We expected them to grow. Sometimes we grow, we don't grow due to some deficiency. That sometimes we do grow, but then there are other times where we don't grow because of some deficiency. There is a malfunction in our growth. In fact, there are some people grow naturally, and then for some unexplained reason, uh, they just stop growing. The shortest man on record is two feet and eight inches tall. He is normal in every other way, except that his pituitary glands cease to produce hormones for continued growth. It produced significantly less than what is needed to reach into normal height. The technical term for this is dwarfism. But then on the other hand, there are people who grow in the opposite direction. The tallest man on record in the 20th century was Robert Parishing Watlow. Born February 22nd, 1918, died July 15, 1940. He was known as the Alton Giant, the Giant of Illinois. He was born and raised in Alton, Illinois, suburb of St. Louis, Missouri. He grew to be eight feet, 11 inches tall. His internal organs were incapable of keeping up with the rapid growth and he died as a result. You know, 
I used to go to the, to the pediatrician uh, to find out the height, the weight, and the circumference of a child's head. But now you can log the height, the weight, and the circumference of a child's head on the internet and predict the growth level of the baby. But there is no tool tonight uh, on the internet to measure our spiritual growth. How do we measure that? How do we determine how much we have really grown up in the Lord Jesus Christ? All we have is the living word of God in our hands. It gives us some insight about how we ought to grow, how we ought to grow. Let me just tell you tonight that the natural man cannot grow and for the purpose of the lesson, spiral upward on his own. No, the natural man cannot do that. With the carnal man, growth is impaired. With the spiritual man, on the other hand, growth is empowered because it is the Holy Spirit of God that empowers us to grow and to continue to help us to grow. When we look at this lesson as recorded by Peter, Peter mentions at the opening of the text two changes in his life when he describes himself as a bond servant and as an apostle. Servant really is actually the term slave. This word means that Peter's desires were solely on obeying Jesus Christ and being his willing follower. In reality, it is a depiction of submission. And you know, to submit simply means that accept or yield to a superior force or the authority or the will of another person. Well, who are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus Christ. We're to accept and, 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 and to submit ourselves to the will of Jesus Christ. We're to be committed followers. We're not to be uh, seasonal followers, if you will. No, I've decided to make Jesus my choice. I've decided I'm going to follow him all the way. That's that takes a determined commitment because there will be some things that arises in your life that will impair or try to impair your spiritual growth. And, and, and when you look back over your life, you got to look at and take an honest evaluation of have I made any growth progress? Have I grown in Christ? Hmm. Let me just say it like this. Have we grown in it since the pandemic? You got pre-pandemic Christian, and now you have post-pandemic Christian. And have we grown in it since this pandemic ravaged our land? And, and I would tell you tonight that all of us should have grown some. Now, growth is measured differently, and we're not the ones who make that determination. That determination is made by God. But I will submit tonight that all of us should have, should have, this is McKenzie now, should have increased. We should have spiraled upward. Because if nothing else, something about this pandemic should have made you reach out and cry out to God just a little bit more. Something about this pandemic and what we see happening in our land and the political landscape that's taking shape right now in the very, our very presence, something about those things should have made you draw closer to God and not farther away from God. Look at this. Notice what else Peter says in verse 1. To those who have obtained like precious faith. The New American Standard Bible reads like this. It says, to those who have received the faith of the same kind as ours. Faith, faith means the trust or belief 
that brings a person to embrace Jesus Christ as their personal savior from sin. That's saving faith that we're talking about. We have the same father, same savior, same Holy Spirit. Yours ain't no better than mine. And we serve the same God. So that there's no room for arrogance tonight. That there's no room for uh, self-boasting. No, not tonight. Uh, because all of us have the same daddy. All of us serve the same God. And since we all serve the same God, we're all his children. Precious. That word precious. Because Peter says to those who have attained like precious faith. Precious was used to describe foreigners in a country who asked for and received equal citizenship in that country. As Christians, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been given equal rights of citizenship in the kingdom of God. Our faith is precious in the eyes of God as the faith of the apostles. Look with me now, real quickly at Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four, and I wanna look at verse, start at verse 11, read down to verse 16. Ephesians chapter four. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Hmm. There are three distinguishing factors of a great church. Three distinguishing factors of a great church. Number one, unity. There is one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And there is only one true and living God. So unity, when we look at the distinguishing factors of a great church, unity sits at the top of that list. But then Diversity is the second one. We're not all the same. We, we come from different backgrounds. We, we come from different uh, educational grounds. We, we, we come from different experiences. So diversity is, is a part of a great church. We have different gifts. All of us don't have the same gift. What a boring church that would be if all of us had the same gift. Ah, talk to me tonight. Well, all of us don't have the same abilities. Listen, all of us, again, we have different backgrounds. But listen at what Paul says in Ephesians 4. He said the reason why there is diversity in the church, because he says, and he gave some, what? Apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors. Teachers, here it is, verse 12. Why did you do it? He says, I got an answer. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body 
of Christ. Three different reasons why. So when we look at the qualities and the attributes of a great church, there has to be diversity. Everybody is not going to uh, have the same level of gifts or the same background. And here's the reason why. Paul says the reason why God did it that way is for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, because you need some people who are qualified and able to do different things because of their own background. They bring value to the body of Christ. But then the other one is not only unity, not only diversity, but maturity. That's a big one. Maturity. Maturity. <clears throat> look at, look at uh, verse 15, going back to 2 Peter. Let me get that. Verse 15. Notice what he says. Moreover, I will diligently endeavor to see to it that even after my departure, you will be able at all times to call these things to mind. Now, think about this. Do you know what most church members need to do most of all? Not, not, not necessarily the coming together in unity. There's maturity. That's, that's the one thing that I'm not just talking about here in South Florida, Mount Nebo. I'm talking about churches universally. The one thing, the one quality that we need to have most of all is maturity. Maturity. Look at this. Paul says in Ephesians 4, but speaking the truth in love may grow up, may grow up, that's King James Version, may grow up, what? Into him. Not Paul wasn't talking about himself. He's talking about Jesus Christ, that we may grow up in Jesus Christ in all things, which is what? Paul says he is the head, even Christ. My, my, my. Grow up. That's, that's what we need to do more so than anything. Paul says in, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, verses 22 and 24, that you put off concerning your formal conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul says, Here, here's what you got to do. You got to put off some things. But then also at the same time, you got to be renewed in your mind. And then you got to put on a new man. It's like changing clothes. I remember uh, growing up, we would go to school. We had we'd had two different sets of clothes. We had school clothes. And then we had play clothes or work clothes. You could not take your school clothes and then go outside and play. No, when you got home, you had to take off, old man, had to take off those school clothes and put on your play clothes because those school clothes had to last you all year long. Talk to me somebody tonight. But, but, but now listen, listen. What are some stumbling blocks to Christians not growing or spiraling upward in the Lord Jesus Christ. I got an answer for you. When we look at verse 14 of Ephesians 4, Paul says that we should no longer be children. New Living Translation says that we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about with every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. You know, there are some slick people out there. And they can make some things sound like the truth, but in reality, they're not truth at all. So Paul says, we got some problems in the church. Paul says, the first problem is immaturity. Paul says, we will no longer be infants, juvenile, unlearned, unschooled, untutored, legally a minor. In the Greek, that word literally means to be ignorant. There's a difference, beloved, between childishness 
and childlikeness. Childishness and childlikeness. There's a big difference. We enter into the kingdom of God as a child that clings desperately onto his or her parents in a storm and night. That parent clings desperately to their child. That's what childlikeness looks like. But childishness, childishness, childishness is totally different. It is falling out when we can't have our way. It's throwing fits. It's taking out marbles and going home when we can't have our That's childishness. And Paul says that's a sign of immaturity. Yes, we are a diversified body. Yes, we are. But that doesn't mean that we should be immature. No. We should be, we should have displays of maturity where we continue to grow in Christ. Listen, let me share this real quickly and I'm going to get back. When you look at the Jerusalem church in the book of Acts, the early church, the first church, they were not without problems. That, that's, that's how we came into what has now become the office of the deacon. Because there were some murmurings and complainings among the Hebrews and the Grecian women. That, that, that was, that was, there was conflict. And, and the apostle said, listen, we don't have time to deal with this. So we, we're going to ask you to look out among yourselves some men, and I already mentioned it some time before, of honest report, full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit, and which we may appoint over these matters. Because we got to get back to the matters of importance, that is the prayer and the study of God's word. I can't feed you properly if I'm overwhelmed all the time. Talk to me tonight. Talk to me tonight. Talk to me tonight. Paul says there has to be some maturity because immature individuals will wear you out. Talk to me tonight. Talk to me. Immature people will wear you out because they constantly come to you with baby stuff. At some point, as siblings, my brothers and I, and my sisters, we, we, didn't, we didn't go to our mom and dad with everything. There were some things we handled among ourselves. And in and, 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 and reality, whenever your older siblings spoke up, the younger siblings knew to get in line because that was just like your parents speaking to you. Listen. And so what we desperately need in our churches now is some mature individuals who have spirit enough in them, that is the spirit of the Holy Spirit, in them that they can take those babies who are actively immature and say, listen, baby, listen, listen. Let's, first of all, let's pray together. Come, let's talk about, let's reason together and work this thing out. Because this is not the way God would have us to operate in his kingdom. Immature. That's one of the problems. But then the other one that Paul mentions is instability. Instability. Small and large ships have anchors. Sound Bible teaching will keep you from being tossed and blown. Toss means to be inundated with waves beating upon your boat without a rudder to guide and direct you. Blown is what happens to a piece of paper caught up by the wind. It is what happens when hurricane force winds rip the tiles off roofs, flip cars over, knock down a billboard sign. That's what happens when wind blows. Paul is saying that when the church is filled with mature persons, these kind of things won't happen. Hmm. Won't run after something just because they say it is religious. You'll be able to decipher and to know and to discern whether they be the spirit of God or not. The Amplified says, so that we are no longer children, spiritually immature, tossed back and forth like ships on a stormy sea, carried about by every wind of shifting doctrine, by the cunning and trickery of unscrupulous men, by the deceitful scheming of people 
ready to do anything for personal profit. Paul says here, so we won't be foolish, unsuspecting, gullible, being a sucker, susceptible. And sadly, there are some who stand in the pulpit, on stages and on street corners, with the sole purpose of deceiving people. Talk to me, talk to me. They are smooth operators. They are professional tricksters. They know how to deceive. They play with the word of God as if it was a toy for their own selfish gain. My, 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 how they've led many people astray. But then how do we, lastly tonight, how do we create a healthy environment so that God is pleased with us? In verse 15, Paul says, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. This is the purpose of speaking truth in love. You hear the gospel that you may grow up into Christ. This is growth delineated. When you grow up in Christ, it doesn't mean that you and Christ sit together. That is one of the interpretations that people have drawn away. No, he's the head and we are and the source and we are the body. The body parts gets or receive its signals from the head, which is the center and the circumference, the control center, the tower, the control tower, if you will, of the church. The church is under the headship of Jesus Christ. So the real effect of a church in a community is reflected, watch this now, in the character of its members. Talk to me. Let me say that one more time. The real effect of a church in a community is reflected in the character of its members. Are you attractive? And when I say are you attractive, I'm talking about the church as a whole. Are you attractive? Because people watch you when you least expect it. They're, they're always watching you. And listen, they know where you go to church better than you do. They, they know that you're a member of Mount Nebo. They know that, oh man, I saw a member of Mount Nebo on the other side of the time. Man, they, they, were, they weren't acting like they were a church person. They were acting like somebody else. They know, they know. So you gotta always be careful of how you conduct yourself, even out in the marketplace of our world. So our goal tonight is to continue to spiral upward in Jesus Christ. God desires that we grow. In fact, he expects us to grow. Let me leave you with this scripture. Romans 12 and 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Is God pleased with me? I would hope tonight that as you've heard this lesson and last week's lesson that we have given you some nuggets, some things that you can apply to your life that will help you spiral upward in your spiritual Christian walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Until next time, keep serving, serving the Lord. Will you love me? Yes.